Hi everyone, and welcome to the second episode of Steep Chat. My name is Andreas Kopp, I'm a doctoral candidate here at the Department of Science, Technology, Engineering and Public Policy. We're here today to talk about science advice and the role of academia in policy making. Joining me for our discussion are Flo Gretrix, who is policy advisor here at Steep's Policy Impact Lab, Dr. Chris Tyler, who is director of the Policy Impact Lab and director of public policy here at Steep, and Professor Arthur Peterson, who is professor of science, technology, and public policy also here at Steep. What are we talking about when we speak of science advice? Um, I guess on the broadest terms, I'd say it's kind of the processes, uh, the structures and the institutions by which science advice can get into the hands of policymakers. Um, and not necessarily just the one way in which a policymaker makes a decision, but one of the tools in their box that they can use when, when making big decisions on any topic. Well, I think there are the term science advice is very much an Anglo term, um, and it's, there are many other terms in other countries to explain the same sorts of processes. But if we split it into three components, really, there's what do we mean by science? What, what, what do we mean by the process of advice? And who do we mean as the target of that advice? And science, uh, as we define it uh, in STEEP, by virtue of the name, is extremely broad. Um, obviously, there's the technical, the hard sciences, the engineering um, and technology, but there's also the social sciences, a really important component of that. And with respect to policymakers, when they're receiving it, they think about that as evidence. And I think that's the sort of the single catch-all phrase there. In terms of the process, um, it's everything from uh, providing summaries of research evidence um, through to something on the edge of advocacy. And depending on the context that one is advising, you can take various roles. If you're advising a large number of politicians, for example, um, you have to be very careful about how you phrase and frame your science advice so that you don't annoy people on the right or the left and, and so on. You have to be quite sensitive to that. If, however, you're advising, say, to a government minister where the range of policy options available are much narrower, then the advice that you're giving can be much more targeted. So there are a range of processes that you can take. And then, who's the target audience? From Steve's perspective, policymakers are essentially people who make decisions. And we're interested particularly in policy bodies, everything from government uh, departments, agencies, parliament and so on. But we also have to appreciate there are a wide range of other decision makers, people who are both influencers of that system who we would want to work with, and people in, say, industry, um, where an awful lot of policy decisions are extremely important to the wider um, social structure of uh, decision making. Arthur, does it mean we can't speak of the fifth branch of government, like Gila Chila Jasanov did when we talk about science advice? Well, interesting. Some people think, or some scientists think, that, that there is a separate fifth branch. So the first three are the usual ones, executive branch, legislative branch, and then, of course, the judicial branch. And then the fourth is the kind of agencies that have a regulatory statute and make decisions, and then they need technical advice. And then the idea is that that comes from a fifth branch of scientific advisors. I doubt a little bit whether that's a uniform body um, and also how much power it actually has. But it is important to realize you have power as an expert to define the terms of decisions. How does policy advice then actually look like in the UK context? I mean, Chris, you've been head of post, the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology, mm -hmm. for five years. Um, how does it actually look like in practice? Uh, it's, a, it's a good question. The, the UK doesn't have a, what I would define as a typical system of science advice. I'm not sure if there is such a thing. Um, I think the most characteristic element of the UK science advisory system is the, uh, the wide adoption of chief scientific advisors. Um, so the government has a chief scientific advisor supported by an office of roughly 80 people. Um, and every single government department has a chief scientific advisor, and a lot of the agencies have chief scientific advisors as well. And each of those, pers each of those people is responsible for bringing uh, research evidence into uh, the, the department, the policy domain that they work in. Um, so they, in one sense, they're a convener. 
Um, they are responsible for sort of pushing that evidence down into the, the hierarchy of, of the, the place that they work. Um, and they tend to perform functions such as helping decision makers work through the range of options available to them. Um, and um, at the one end, they help people make better decisions. And on the other side, they help people stop making stupid decisions. Um, with respect to Parliament, um, it's a it's a much more um, a sort of egalitarian uh, system. It's much less hierarchical because there's more than a thousand politicians who are all essentially equal in in their, in power, um, and as a result, the science advisory system is equally less hierarchical, um, and it's much more and it's very distributed also across select committees um, through research services coming out of the House of Commons and House of Lords libraries, and the office that I ran, the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology, which with is. Uh, to each of those other places which are kind of very responsive to what MPs need, um, POST is a very proactive advisor deciding the things that parliamentarians need to know and then telling them. Now, Arthur, you have been uh, chief scientist for one of these agencies. You were chief scientist for the Dutch Environmental Assessment Agency for um, four years, five years. Um, how does this compare to, to the UK and how does science advice uh, look like internationally? Because you also have experience uh, on the international... Well, let me international start with, with the Netherlands and then get to the international example. Here in Steep, um, my doctoral candidates and colleagues often say that all the literature that we look at on the Dutch system, that's actually too Dutch to function. <laughs> um, I don't think it is, which is why we still try to learn from it. Um, and that's largely about how can you organize that different points of view are, let's say, put on the table uh, in, a, in a way, I wouldn't say that's depoliticized, but that, that different decision makers can actually really work with, both in, uh, in government, parliament and other settings. So internationally, um, a very interesting example of science advice is the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which was set up at the end of the 80s to resolve the question, are humans causing climate change? And they have really set up a huge body um, which has to operate by consensus like any UN body, But the interesting thing here is, it's ran and led by the best scientists in climate science. And they do invite the best experts to write big reports and chapters, and then governments have to decide, word by word, line by line, on what is the appropriate summary of the science, with the veto right for the authors in terms of any changes, whether they still represent the underlying chapters. Now this is, on the one hand, a very cumbersome process, but I think it's a beautiful example of diplomacy of bringing science and politics together and ending up with something that's both usable and still a good representation of the science. In fact, today we are actually subject to many fake news all the time. Many policy debates, you name it, so I mean climate change, social inequality and so on, actually rely on science advice and the input of scientists. We can observe it at the moment at COP24 taking place in Katowice in Poland. So how can scientists actually get hurt? How can they stand out? Do they speak truth to power, Arthur? Well, so there's a discussion there on how to receive the report by the IPCC in the context of the climate negotiations, where you have to make decisions on what's the consequence of this science. Um, and do you welcome the report or do you note the report? That's the big political debate at the moment. I think that scientists are often stealth advocates, right? So they produce a report, it should be 1.5, and now it should be 1.5, and if you don't do 1.5, you didn't listen to the science. Well, that's completely wrong in terms of how the advisory system works or should work. Um, so I do understand frustrations. I do not see within the context of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change any discussion on the quality of the, of the report. It's just the decision has to be taken, what do we do on the basis of that? So, Chris, does that mean that the objectivity of science does, does not exist? Especially if you think about different scientific disciplines, comparing, for example, natural science versus social science? Uh, yes slash no, um, as is always the case with these, these things. Um, if, you, uh, if you ask a question to which there is uh, one answer, science is the best way of getting there finding that out. And from a policy perspective, that's great and actually more than good enough. Um, but scientists who are involved in 
bringing together large quantities of evidence related to big, difficult policy problems have to be aware of the fact that uh, the, the combination of individual facts do not make a policy answer. And with that res in, in that respect, um, science struggles with itself um, in, an, in a kind of uh, philosophical and cultural way. Um, for example, have you ever met a conservation scientist who didn't think that conservation was actually a good thing? And in that respect, the science that they're doing is of value, but they have some inherent values in their very approach to doing science that then spill over into the advice that they offer to policymakers. And that's where we quite often rub up against this problem between the, the academic world and the policy world, where it feels to the researchers like they're presenting the evidence, and it looks to the policymakers like they're pushing an agenda. And it isn't really anyone's fault, except for the fact that as scientists, we should as a breed be more aware of the, uh, the epistemic nature of ourselves and the way we're communicating and the body of work that we're communicating to policymakers. Um, and therein lies the primary role of STEEP. Um, as a kind of as a future shaper of what science advice should look. Talking about Steep, we uh, have well, a significant part of Steep is the, the policy outreach, uh, in addition to the education and the, the research that we do. So uh, let me let me turn to Flo. You are a um, policy advisor in Steep. You work at the Policy Impact Lab. Um, how um, how does that work look like, and what is the contribution that that Steep is is, is doing to to policy making? Um, well, the team is really new. Um, I've been here only a few weeks now, and it's it's really exciting um, what we're hoping to do with the policy impact unit. So, obviously, SEEP has um, a massive range of expertise in researchers and the students, um, and a nice interdisciplinary focus, um, which is really exciting uh, to work on. So, uh, the policy impact unit um, can work can work with with academics to hopefully get some, some of the really exciting world leading research in STEEP but also across the faculty and even across UCL into, into policy makers eyes so, um, so we've kind of got three, three things we, we want to do so the first is at the design stage when the researchers are designing a research project well how could, how could this benefit policy makers so really thinking about it from the outset um, and then also when, when the research is taking place obviously the academics are really really busy focusing on their research but that's where we can come in and say, okay, well, this might be of interest to this specific piece of legislation coming up. Um, so that's where we can really do the groundwork and, and get the engagement started um, and take some of the load off the academics. Um, and then also further on, how do we monitor the impact of that work, which is really important um, now for the REF, um, but also just generally we want, to, we want to make sure that all of the, the research that's being done is um, being recognised and getting out there. Um, so it's really exciting, but it's really new. Um, so yeah, just getting started really with uh, Chris and uh, Jenny. All right, does that mean then, Chris, does, uh, does science advice go beyond policy? Is it also relevant for industry? Of course. How so? Don't they do their own research? Don't they do their own science? The, the, the range of issues that um, industry are working on intersect and overlap so much with the policy world. I, I don't intellectually distinguish between science advice in, in either context. Um, I think uh, the way that science is conducted in industry tends to differ from the way that science is conducted in academia. I mean, in that respect, the, the internal science advisory systems may differ. Um, but the vast majority of the uh, kind of the, the big um, innovation and societal issues that you would uh, sort of typically characterize in case study for the engagement between academia and industry um, are largely similar in that they have to pull together such a wide range of research you're actually bringing in research from academia and from industry anyway um, and then it, it should be community, communicated in an open and honest way and uh, collaborative way with whatever party you're working with um, and so uh, I, I don't see industry as being a particularly uh, as a unique place for uh, for science advice or a, a, or requiring a unique way of communicating it. 
talking about uh, communicating uh, science and results that uh, conclusions that scientists have brought forward, are there the process in academia is often very lengthy. Scientists publish in uh, large books or go through a lengthy peer review process. What is actually the most effective way to get science into policy? Is it through peer review journals? Is it through lengthy journal articles? Well, you have to have that. So the, the main quality that scientists have is that they're building up, they're able to build up a chain of reference, as you can call it. So they, they build step after step after step from a particular conclusion to a particular paper to what's happening in the lab to what they do in the lab, etc. Um, so that's a necessary thing and actually your credibility is fully dependent on, on how convincing those chains of reference are. Now, bringing all those details into the public domain, which, which, which we do, right, by making also with the open access movement, everything is going to be available, doesn't really necessarily directly influence the quality of decision making. So that's where the science advice element comes in, mm -hmm. where you need people who are skilled in being able to see what the complexities of the conclusions are, what the scope is, which decisions may be impacted by those, what the differences of view uh, are. And that's not only, let's say, a skill that's needed for academics, but also on the receiving side. So you also have to know what are the, in the industry and in government, what are the questions that I should ask, right? So it is, and is there an interface is actually a big question in a sense. Is there, is there one single interface and there are some countries like the Dutch uh, who sometimes have this, this agency sitting at the interface, policy interface institutions. But that's, that's just one way where all these things still mix, right? The decision making and the academics that are brought together. So it's not, um, uh, it's not one skill uh, in terms of how you do science advice, but you do need uh, all the books uh, and the articles and the labs and the models in order to do science advice. That's right, and you um, uh, have to think about the kind of where the evidence is coming from, as, as Arthur's pointed out, you need to think about the processes um, by which the flow of information works um, and the flow of people works. And I think um, it's, it's quite typical for people working in a bureaucracy to really focus on flows of information. Um, but if you actually look at the evidence of what influences decision makers, it's that conversation with someone. It's the conversation you have over a cup of coffee or a beer, or if you're in the UK, a cup of tea. Um, those are the things that actually change people's minds. And what we're doing as a department is trying to uh, help shape uh, decision-making processes, science advisory processes, mechanisms for doing science in the first place, in the full understanding that it's those individual relationships between people that ultimately are going to make this decision and we have to fit around that. And to add on that, it's not only, uh, let's say, the cognitive that plays a role here, but also the emotional qualities, right? So in terms of the training, we do scenarios, you're being put under pressure, you're having to deal with decision makers that put you in a pressurized situation. And how do you deal with your own emotions, with their emotions, how do you relate to that? So it's about the people in the end. Indeed. It is about the people in the end, and uh, we at Steve, we not only reach out to policymakers and supply science advice, but we also train these people, these people at the interface. Um, we have a doctoral program, we also have our Masters of Public Administration. So, Flo, if I could ask you, what actually makes a good policy advisor? What are the three skills that you would really give someone on the way, somebody who's here doing our MPA or somebody who wants to join us at Steve? Well, I think I'm still learning, to be honest, I'm quite early in my career myself. Um, I think the main skills um, Arthur and Chris have touched on a little bit, but I think the ability to see something through another lens is really, really important. So you might believe with all your heart and soul that your evidence is essential to this piece of policy, but you need to appreciate that they have a million other things to consider, um, public perception, the budget, and those kind of things. So just being aware of that is really important. Um, and secondly, I think your communication skills in all different areas. So oral, um, you might get a civil servant phoning you up and saying, my boss wants to know X, Y, and Z. Um, so you need to be able to orally communicate really well, um, but also in a written form. So you need to be able to translate the evidence. You need to be able to write it in a way that makes sense. Um, so all of the kind of exercises you might do at university, writing 
an essay, doing a presentation, you might think they're not related to your job, but all of those skills are really, really essential. Um, and a third one, I think I would say paying attention to detail is really, really important. Um, and just kind of keeping up to date with things going on in government and being interested and aware of them is really important. So, for example, um, if you're trying to influence a bill, there are really certain specific times where you're likely to have the most influence. So following that um, and taking your chances to kind of use that window of opportunity you might have. Um, and just being persistent because sometimes it doesn't work and that's okay. Um, but sometimes it does. So. How are these uh, skills reflected in what we teach here at Steep? How are these skills reflected in our MPA? Arthur? I think... Um, Starting with the uh, looking at detail, being able to look at detail, being able to understand complexity, being able to understand uncertainty. One of the first courses that we that we teach is evidence for decision making, where you really have to learn not to be afraid of a nature paper. Also, being able to deal with social science uh, and and capture that in ways uh, in very short pieces of writing that are accessible to chief scientists, for instance, right? And that's a, it's challenging, but that's that's a very good skill to to get. At the same time, what you need is, uh, let's say, a kind of civics. You need to know how decision making works. So we do, uh, we have a very targeted course in public administration, which is not standard because it de really deals with you have to make decisions again under uncertainty, which means all sorts of changes are happening at, at and sometimes at very specified moments and sometimes more ad hoc and, and, and in a chaotic way. You have to deal with those processes. Uh, as well, uh, and I think finally, uh, what's very nice in this program as well, we focus on policy entrepreneurship, so that people really start thinking creatively about how to put policy proposals together, which are very, let's say, heavy on the evidence, uh, how to do that, how to present that, uh, how to sell that, and then dealing with the emotions and all of that. So, it's a nice program. It is one of my favourite things about the program, um, compared with others that I've seen, is that um, the students are getting exposed to people who actually do it for a living. Um, it's not just an academic who studied it standing up and saying, this is how I think things work. Um, we actually bring in, as part of the teaching program, people from the outside who are kind of getting their hands dirty on one side of the, the, the equation or the other. Now lastly, before we wrap up, um, a very open question to all three of you. How do you think policy advice will change in the future and what are the issues to look out for for policymakers, academics, but also public policy students? Chris? Um, it's a really open-ended question. I think um, in the near term, the, um, the biggest challenge, I think, for all of us is to consider how science advice, how science advice fits in democracy. Um, it feels to a lot of people that liberal democracy is under threat in some way in, in different parts of the world. Um, and that's a complicated thing. And there's absolutely no way that the provision of knowledge into the decision-making process isn't part of that equation. Um, and I would argue as it should be part of the, equa the equation for making the system work better. Um, and we, as a, as a sort of science advisory community, are going to have to, I think, up our game at working with political scientists and philosophers and people working on the ground to try and flex our system, to help them flex their system, because the, the way that the system works at the moment is struggling. Um, which brings me to the kind of the second answer, which is further down the road, um, 2050, 2070, maybe the turn of the century, we're going to start bumping up against um, huge changes in the workforce because of AI. And AI will also have huge implications in decision-making systems. It won't just be humans collecting knowledge created by humans and then providing it to human decision-makers. Computers are going to play a role at both ends of that equation. And we have no kind of mechanism for making that happen right now. That's a whole new area of research that, that somebody needs to, to grab pronto. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a tricky question. I think the massive global challenges that we're facing right now, so climate change, you've talked about obesity, aging population, technology, um, food security, for example, they all need interdisciplinary advice. So. 
I think one of the challenges is how we make sure that all aspects of science, or however we define science or evidence, are included in those discussions because it's not just the chemistry of the atmosphere or it's not just, uh, I can't think of any other examples, the social elements, but it's everything together. So we need to make sure that the evidence being received by policymakers captures all of that, which I think is a massive challenge. And even within, we have the CSA network, but even then some of them have more influence than others. Some of them work part-time, some of them work full-time. So it's not it's not fully even already. So I think there are quite a lot of challenges there. Um, but it's exciting, it's an opportunity. So. Yeah, well, I will, um, with, uh, let's say, eagerness work on, on how science advice spreads all across the globe in countries that are still very much developing. Um, and some things that are important there is a focus on social outcomes mm -hmm. and how science advice plays a role there. And also to recognize that also in our present, let's say, developed societies, there is this kind of idea of how science advice links with ideology, with, uh, with cultural biases, uh, underrepresented voices, are they represented well with, by science advice? I think that's really important. Which is why I'm really working on new research in science, religion and public policy as well, as a, as a way to make that explicit and to work on that. Well, it sounds like there is uh, many challenges, many challenges up on the road. Um, many things that we do in Steep will probably feature um, in that in the future. So, good thing that we have the MPA to train our students to, to work with this for gov government or with government. Thank you. And thank you all three so much for joining us today. Thank you, Flo, Chris and Arthur. That was the second episode of Steep Chat discussing science advice and the role of academia in policymaking. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you took a lot away from this and stay tuned for upcoming episodes very soon. Stay curious. <laughs>